we get started. Good afternoon, everyone, to those that have joined us in the past. Welcome back. And to those that are new here, I'm glad that you all could join us. My name is Jocelyn. I work at the Heinz History Center. I'm joined with my coworker, Amanda. We will be leading you through this presentation today. Our coworker, Laura, is in the background, keeping an eye out on the chat and the Q&A. Just a few things to note, this is a webinar, so you can see Amanda and I, but we cannot see you and you cannot see anyone else. Any comments, ideas, or answers you may have, go ahead and drop those in the chat box. For any questions you might have or want to ask, go ahead and use that Q&A box. We also have live captioning for this program and you can access that by hitting the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Is that all? Did I miss anything, Amanda? <laughs> no, I think you're good. We still have our um, attendee numbers are still going up quite a lot. So um, yeah. we're just going to reiterate that we can, um, we're going to use the chat and the Q&A for those of you who just joined us uh, in order to answer anything or ask questions as we go through the presentation. Um, but I think you can um, go ahead and get started. I saw it pause for a moment at 33 and I was like, I guess. So let me yeah. start sharing. <laughs> <Good shot>. right <laughs> up. Let me start sharing my screen while a few more people stream in. All right, again, welcome to this program. We will be talking about Western Pennsylvania and how the Great Migration really focused, really helped shape this area. But of course, before we get into that, we have to look at that backstory. And we also have to talk about a few words that we are going to be using throughout this presentation. So, We'll be talking about Jim Crow laws. So those are laws that legally separated black people from white people, particularly in Southern states. A migrant, so a person who moves from one place to another, especially in order to find work or better living conditions. And segregation, so keeping people separate by race in schools, housing, public spaces, and in that general sense. Were there any quick questions about those three words? No, nothing so far. Nothing in the chat at all so far. All right, great. Just a little quick overview of those words that we're gonna be using. Now we'll get into that backstory. So before we get into this massive movement of people, there's a few events that we have that happen in, the, in our nation, specifically in the South, that really set the stage for this large movement of African-Americans from Southern states to Northern states. So 1863, we have the Emancipation Proclamation, which basically freed all enslaved people. Then 1865 was the end of the Civil War. And then after that, we have this period that is called Reconstruction. So in 1865 to 1877, this period of Reconstruction had three main goals. So it was to one, restore the union. So bring the North and South together to work as one, as a one united country. It was also a goal to transform the South and kind of update their values and their legal systems. And then there was also a creation of laws to give those formerly enslaved people rights So this was done by really watching over these Southern states. So there were federal troops that would take control over these states and watch over them, make sure they're following these different guidelines that are set up by the federal government. But in 1877, the last federal troops left the South and the country's focus really began to shift from this moment after the Civil War into focusing on economic situations. So after that, 
from 1890 to 1910, these Southern states decided they were going to rewrite their constitutions. So by doing this and rewriting these basic laws and rules that states are going to follow, they were able to legally take away some of those rights that the federal government gave to these newly free people. And then 1860, 1816, after all this has happened, you really begin to see that mass movement of people from the South to Northern states. So there's a lot of information jam packed into that one slide. Were there any questions or comments about that? No, nothing so far. There is just one um, little conversation that we're having in the chat that I just wanna say out loud. Someone is um, asking us about whether we can switch it to people asking questions anonymously so they don't have to worry about being shy. Um, and I just wanna say, we're gonna keep it the way that it is, but we will not be saying out loud or anything like that who is asking questions. So uh, feel free to go ahead and contribute things in there. Don't worry about it. We're not gonna share your name out loud and you shouldn't be able to see what other people are posting in the chat anymore. All right, great. Um, but yeah, feel free to question anything. We always do welcome those questions um, and we will always try to get answered them as best as we can. We're always wanting to know what you wanna know more about. So the Great Migration was this large movement of black Southerners to Northern cities. In the Jim Crow era of the South, black people experienced a different type of racism and prejudice. Legally, they were free men and women, but living similar to how they would if they were enslaved. They were often given jobs at the lowest tier of the ladder, so sharecropping or being servants in homes. And this always, and this tended to keep them in debt, so it was a never ending cycle of having to work to pay off their debt and then getting in more debt as they're working. So living in the South, Black people faced apparent racism every day from the interactions they had with white people to the jobs they were able to hold. All of this was made legal by something we know as the Jim Crow laws, which was supposed to keep everything separate but remain equal. And it was clear that that was something that did not happen. And the people saw these large industrial Northern cities as an opportunity to better life, better their life. And this was the main idea of what many people had, which would later prove, which they would later find out wasn't necessarily the truth. So in this slide, we just see some of the segregation that would be happening in the South from on buses with these partitions blocking the back from the front that are clearly marked with coloreds only or whites only, as well as a storefront that they that African-Americans wouldn't be able to enter. So going over those, that little bit of background information, why do you think black people left the South? Why did they decide to leave the South? And go ahead and drop any answers or ideas that you have into that chat box for Amanda or Laura to share out. We're starting to get some answers in the chat, Jocelyn, um, related to jobs. So people leaving the South to find job opportunities and better jobs in the North, uh, as well as unfair social treatment um, to, sorry, so that they can live a free life and because the, of the racism that they were experiencing in the South. Yeah, those are all really great answers for why people are living in the South and many of you are totally correct. So they faced a lot of poverty, racial oppression, lack of safety. And then on the other hand, there was constant flooding. So the work they were doing with farming and the agricultural work would often be flooded, ruining the harvest. And there was also a 
sole weevil infestation. So that is an insect that would come over and eat mostly cotton crops, which was of course a large business in the South at the time. So yes, you had these people leaving the South because they didn't have access to good paying jobs and the job that did have access to were basically the same thing they were doing when they were enslaved. You also had the public um, direct violence that African-Americans often faced with public lynchings and oftentimes being criminalized for very small reasons. So these are all reasons that people decided that they were going to leave their homes in the South and head to these Northern cities. So why did black people come to Pittsburgh? So what about Pittsburgh made them say, that is where I want to go? Any ideas? So jobs is the number one thing that's coming up so far about why people would come to Pittsburgh. Someone says it's the most south part of the north. I like that explanation of our location. Yeah, so Pittsburgh's right over that Mason-Dixie line. So it's a little southern, but it still is past that line where a lot of people would face that reason. Uh, people are talking about the kinds of jobs in steel, uh, railroads, oil, um, factories. Yeah, so Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania had a really diverse job market because of the industry that we had here. So one of the main reasons that people came here is because there were so many jobs available. And this was in part due to something else that was happening in the United States at this time. So during the early 1900s, World where World War One began. So a lot of the people in the north, all of a lot of the white northerner people were being drafted into the army and being sent overseas. So them having to leave left these jobs open for African African Americans to come up and fill. There is also more safety available for them up here. So they Although they would still face prejudice and discrimination, it wasn't going to be outward, it wasn't always going to be outward violence or a threat of death, what they would usually face when they're back down south. And there was also a strong existing African American community in Western Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh specifically. Oh, Jocelyn, I wanted to hop on that and just say, um, there's a comment both in the chat and the Q&A about that existing community. So someone mentioned the Pittsburgh Courier um, and sort of that word of mouth about the, the community of African Americans that existed in Pittsburgh um, and Pittsburgh being known as a place that uh, Black people were coming so that more people came here as well. Exactly. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but the Pittsburgh Courier does play a really significant role in uplifting and uplifting African Americans in the area and also bringing African Americans to this area. So in newspapers down south, you have things like this saying that Pittsburgh is this new prosperous town with all of these jobs. And then on Northern newspapers, you have things like this saying that these new people are making good in the North. So this article down here this large article right here is a clipping from a newspaper that was from Birmingham, Alabama in the 1960s. And this smaller one down here is actually from the Pittsburgh Carrier talking about all these new people coming to the area and then having a better life. So it was kind of advertisement that, are, that was attracting these different groups to Pittsburgh, like they were saying in the chat. So you were catching on to exactly where it was going. So you have these publications that are also preaching about how good the North is and saying it's nothing like the South and you should come here. On top of that, you also have something like this scene over here. And this is a image that is the labor agent sent South by Northern industry was familiar presence in the black communities. 
And this is a panel from the migration series by someone named Jacob Lawrence. So he did a whole art project based around the great migration. And this is just one small portion of that. So this image is showing this white man down here in his hand, you can see him with a piece of paper and a pen writing down names and trying to make a deal with these people saying, hey, if you come here, you're gonna make X amount of money. We can get you a ticket to go north. Like we want you here, there's jobs for you. And adding to this picture is the background. So behind all of these African-American men that are lining up to talk to this labor agent, you also have this barren background with a blue sky and this dirt brown. And the only living thing on it is this one tree that just looks like a stick with no leaves. So you could tell that the environment down there wasn't very prosperous. So all these things added up was drawing people to the North. But the South wasn't happy about this large movement of people because at first, they're like, okay, it's just a few. But once the floodgates really opened, they realized this is not a good thing. This is my labor that is going that is going to all this work for cheap. If we lose them, who are going to plow the fields? Who are going to be doing? Who is going to be doing this work? So the South retaliated by making it tougher for African Americans to leave. And one of the things were laws to keep these labor agents from recruiting people as well as the South using scare, tactic, scare tactics to keep African-Americans in these cities and towns. And from here, I'm going to hand it over to Amanda for her to get into the Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania side of this story. But before that, were there any quick questions? I haven't seen anything really um, in the chat um, about your last little bit there since we last checked in there, unless Laura has anything that she wanted to throw in. No, I think you're seeing what I'm seeing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop sharing so Amanda can dig into that Western Pennsylvania side of that story. Great. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen now here. Um, to pick up where Jocelyn has left off uh, with the sort of the Pittsburgh side of the story really or Western Pennsylvania side of the story. Um, so we set a really good groundwork for what was going on in the South and what was helping people to get to places like Pittsburgh. Um, but we always like to talk about an individual story when we talk about these, um, these large groups of people, right? Like the people moving North as part of the Great Migration. And the person that we're gonna talk just a little bit about is this lady here whose name was Lillian Allen. And Lillian Allen lived a very, very long life. So she was born in 1909 in Alabama and she just passed away in 2015 or 2016. She lived to be 107 years old. And so she spent most of her life living here in Pittsburgh, but her lifespan means that she got to witness all of the great migration story um, she was alive through World War I, through World War II, everything that has happened in Pittsburgh and, and the country since. Um, and so her story is really, really interesting. So she came to Pittsburgh as a very young girl. Uh, she was about four years old. And she came here to live with her aunt. And then she ended up going back to Alabama and then came back to Pittsburgh as a teenager when she got married. When she was 17. And her story helps us to know firsthand about what was what life was like for people who were coming here to Pittsburgh. So she did something called an oral history where she basically told her story out loud to an interviewer who recorded it um, so that we could uh, have that for uh, telling her story in the future. She talked all about her arrival in Pittsburgh, what she did once she got here, the kind of jobs that were open to her as a black woman in Pittsburgh. Um, and we're going to listen to just a few seconds, maybe about 40 seconds of her story. And this is going back to sort of why people were coming to Pittsburgh, but I just really like people to be able to hear this in the uh, Lillian Allen's own voice. So she did this recording as an older lady. There's a picture of her when she was older. Um, and so I'm going to play the sound and the text that's up here is sort of a rough transcript of what she is saying. So 
Um, just let me know someone if the sound doesn't work here. So anyway, yeah. Um... Uh, well, my mom, well, that was during the First World War. And the reason he came, my uncle, his uncle by marriage, he came because uh, they drafted all of the white people, foreign people, everybody, they drafted everybody. And when they turned around, they didn't have anybody to do any work. So they went down to the South. And of course, you know, we already had their... Uh, the civil action had gone through, you know, there were no more slaves. Anybody who wanted to come to the North could. So uh, everybody that uh, couldn't come otherwise, they let them come. And Okay, so as we learned from Jocelyn, people are coming because of the labor shortages in the First World War. Um, but it's really interesting to hear that, I think, from a person who actually lived through that and remembers it. So. Um, Lillian Allen is someone that we might touch on again as we get into our um, talking more about what things were like on the Western Pennsylvania end of the Great Migration. Uh, but now I just want to switch into talking about some of the issues that people faced as they were coming here to the city. So of course people are leaving the South for the reasons that we talked about, all kinds of problems they were facing there. That doesn't mean that here in Western Pennsylvania everything was perfect for them, right? There were also issues here in the North um, one of the uh, major issues that people faced here really was housing. Now, um, we're going to look at a document here that was put together by the Urban League of Pittsburgh. So that's a group that still exists today. Uh, the Urban League is all over the United States, and they basically were set up as a way to um, try to provide support for African-American people, not only during the Great Migration, uh, but beyond to try to um, connect uh, newcomers to cities like Pittsburgh with support that they might need there. And so in 1927, they did a little study of newcomers to the Hill District in Pittsburgh. Um, and so the Hill District is a neighborhood um, not far from downtown Pittsburgh, if you're not familiar, predominantly African American neighborhood. But in the past, it was the neighborhood where lots of different people came to on their way into Pittsburgh. So when there are waves of, for instance, Jewish immigration into the city, the Hill District is a place where a lot of those people settled first before they moved on to another part of town. And lots of different waves of immigration went through the Hill District. And then when the Great Migration begins, lots of African American people start moving there too. Um, it's of course not the only place in the city that African American people were moving to, but it does give us a nice case study of what a neighborhood looked like as this was happening. Um, so in 1927, they did this study to figure out where people were coming from. Oh, there's the Hill District, if you're not familiar with where it is. Uh, right here in the middle of the city, up on a hill, of course, between the Strip District and downtown and uptown here, not far from Oakland as well. Um, so they did this study to figure out where people were coming from. And so they studied uh, the schools in the Hill District, and they took a tally of where the students were coming from if that was their first year in those schools. And so the states that we see represented here most are states like Alabama and Georgia and Virginia and South Carolina. And you often hear a lot of people talk about how a lot of people who came from the Great Migration to Pittsburgh are from places like Georgia. And so we kind of see that reflected here uh, in this little survey that was done of the schools. And the survey also tried to understand a little bit more about what was going on for these students at home. And so they did some visits around in the Hill District to explore what was going on in terms of housing because African-American people as they're moving into Pittsburgh and settling in the Hill District are moving into houses that, have, that are already old. They've been there for a long time. Lots of people have moved through the Hill by the time they get there. And what they find is that housing in the Hill District is, is a challenge. It's a real problem. So people are very crowded in to the Hill District. Families, lots and lots of families might be living in houses that were just meant for one family. And rent is extremely high. So people who maybe own these properties in the Hill District know that these people coming into the city need somewhere to be. And so they know that they can charge quite a lot of money for their houses, even if they're not very good houses. Um, and so we found some pictures of what these houses looked like. Now, these are not all from the sort of early part of the Great Migration. These, this picture is from the 1940s on the left here, but um, it gives you a sense of what they were talking about. You know, these wooden houses 
um, maybe not built very well in the first place. It doesn't look too, too bad from the outside, but inside these houses, it was a really, really tough place to live, especially with you when you're crowded in with lots of other people. Uh, there's also a picture here. I'm sure you can all figure out what that is. It's an outhouse. There were a lot of houses uh, in the Hill District and in other parts of the city that still had outhouses at a time where newer houses would have had indoor plumbing, but these houses had never had bathrooms or sinks installed in them. And so that meant people had to go outside to use the bathroom and outside to get water. And um, it was not really a great situation to be in. Um, now, of course, uh, there were also other problems that people were facing and they're all kind of connected to this idea that if these people are moving into Pittsburgh, um, they are not necessarily able to just leave those houses and go live somewhere else or find a job that pays enough money that they don't have to deal with that situation. They're kind of coming in uh, and having to find wherever they can find to sort of settle into Pittsburgh and figure out what they can do from here. And um, another place where they face a lot of uh, problems is in work. And so again, the Urban League uh, in the 1920s, this report will be from 1920, tries to sort of help them out. And the reason that they're facing a lot of problems in work is often because they're coming from a very different place, right? So a lot of the people who are coming as part of the Great Migration might have been sharecroppers. So they were working land. They are living in the countryside. They're not used to being in a crowded, loud environment like you might find if you were living near a steel mill, for instance. And so this is a picture uh, on the right here of a steel mill that was in Hazelwood, uh, a neighborhood here in the city. And you can see it's very smoky. All these houses are just sort of tucked in the hills and crowded around the mill. Uh, and if you imagine a person growing up in somewhere like rural Georgia, this is a very, very different place. And that's not to say that people in rural, rural Georgia had never been to a city before or anything like that. People who worked on the fields in the South might have often worked for part of the year in a city in the South and then worked for a part of the year in the fields. The difference was that Pittsburgh was a very different city because there was all of this industry, people were much more crowded in, um, and they just weren't familiar with um, how things sort of worked here. So if you imagine trying to live in this brand new environment, your new workplace looks a little bit like this picture on the left. And this is a picture of um, a furnace in a steel mill. And you can almost see the heat in this image, right? You can see all this steam and the smoke and totally, totally different environment to what most people were used to. And so that caused problems for the workers and problems for their employers. And so the Urban League kind of put together this sort of conference where they were trying to help the employers understand what the problem was from the workers' perspective and try to smooth that out a little bit. And so things that they highlighted as issues were things like the employers were just not recognizing that that was the situation, that people were just not used to working in these environments. Um, they pointed out that it might be more helpful to the newly arrived migrants if another Black worker who had gone through all of that already was the person who helped them learn their job and sort of got used to what was going to happen in the steel mill. They also pointed out that the companies who were hiring these workers could probably try to do something about the housing issue, maybe encourage people to build housing for workers near the steel mills. And they also tried to tackle the discrimination that people were facing in the workplace, so white workers being promoted over black workers, um, and also a lack of, of additional training so that these new workers could maybe learn what they had to learn to do their job in the first place, but also grow into a new position with more skills. And so we find these organizations are trying to help with all of that, but as historians, this is a really, really important way for us to understand what the problems were that people were facing. Because if it's a big enough problem that they're putting together this conference of all these people coming together to discuss it, that means it's not just a few people that are struggling with this, it's a big, big problem. Anything in the chat there before I move on to our next little, example here. So there isn't anything that I'm seeing in the chat, but I did have a question in the Q&A, um, taking us back to the idea of the Hill District and what it, what was it like 
before the hockey stadium and more commercial buildings were there. Yes. Do you want to tackle that one, Jocelyn, or do you want me to answer that? I sure can. So the Hill District was a very thriving African-American community um, during the great, well, even before the Great Migration. And as more African-Americans filled the city, they did end up being like kind of having to live in that area because of just social reasons, you know, it was a black neighborhood. So they went where the black people were and they didn't really have much option. But because of just the social segregation that naturally happened with inside the Pittsburgh community, the Hill District being African-American community had a lot of African-American owned businesses that thrived and really built up this culture. So you could view the Hill District as a cultural center. And it was, it was this way until the mid 1900s, so around 1940, there was this thing that happened called the Pittsburgh's, Pittsburgh Renaissance, where basically they displaced everyone that lived in the lower hill district. So that would be the part that is where the parking lot for PPG Paints now is. And their idea was that they were gonna build this civic center that was supposed to benefit both the city and the hill district. And what it really ended up doing was really cutting off the access that people had to the Hill District. Because if you think about it, it being right next to downtown, it was once connected to that city center of downtown. So by doing this, they really hurt the position in the community of the Hill District and it's still suffering and trying to bounce back from that today. Yes, yes, absolutely. and. You know, thousands of buildings were torn down as part of that. Um, thousands of people displaced. Hundreds of businesses had to move elsewhere. Um, yeah, a really, a really difficult part of Pittsburgh's history there, um, as it relates to the Hill District. As I was saying, that someone um, put in the Q and A does what we is what we're learning today have anything to do with the Great Depression. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think it does. I think so. Um, uh, I know that when, if you were to listen to more of Lily and Allen's story, that lady whose voice we heard uh, towards the beginning here, um, she talks a lot actually about how um, when the Great Depression happened, it meant that a lot of the jobs that African American people maybe had in these steel mills, so sort of the lower level unskilled jobs that people were getting when they first came here, um, and other jobs like, you know, sweeping floors and things like that started to be more given to white people and the Great Depression in Pittsburgh from Lillian Allen's perspective was actually even harder for um, black people living here because they lost even those jobs that they had access to until that point. Um, so it does, it does connect. Um, absolutely. Good question. Okay. All right. I think we're good to move on. All right. So um, as I always say at the History Center, we are obviously in Pittsburgh, but we talk about Western Pennsylvania. And so um, this story is something that I don't think many people know about. Uh, there was a book written about this um, by a Johnstown uh, local about maybe two years ago um, that kind of gets into this. But um, when people were moving to northern cities, they weren't always just coming to these big cities like Pittsburgh. If you were to look along the rivers in western Pennsylvania, there were steel mills all over the place, right? If you go outside of the city towards like Homestead and Braddock and all of that, they're still there. And so it wasn't just like the city of Pittsburgh where people were coming to. Western Pennsylvania had lots of little steel towns all around it, and one of them is Johnstown. So Johnstown, I think, is about 50 miles east of Pittsburgh. And a lot of African American people also went to Johnstown. Now, you can see in this picture here on the left, Johnstown is, it's quite a beautiful little town actually, um, tucked in the mountains there, much smaller than Pittsburgh. And they had a huge growth in their African American population between 1910 and 1920. It basically more than tripled in that amount of time. And for a small town like Johnstown, that is a big shift uh, in population. And there were also a lot of Mexican workers moving to Johnstown and a lot of white people who had lived there before all of that were not very happy about it. So there were some real tensions in Johnstown in the 1920s. 
Um, and then something really awful happened. So this is a newspaper that's from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is further east even, but it gives us a good sense of what happened here. Um, and so basically um, there was a fight in 1923, there was a fight out on the streets, an argument that happened. Um, it was a black person arguing with some other people. It turned into a situation that got totally out of control and it ended up with um, some people being killed, some people being wounded, uh, and then two of the people that were killed were police in Johnstown. Um, and also the black man that had, had um, started the fight in the first place. And so this situation became uh, really, really, really scary in Johnstown. And people were worried that there was gonna be a riot. Uh, the white people were very upset. The black people were very upset. Um, and what ended up happening is something that is really, really hard for us to get our heads around, I think, today. But the mayor of Johnstown decided that as a result of that, he was going to order all of the Black people who were living in Johnstown, who had not been there for more than seven years, to leave the town, like immediately. And lots of people, not only in Johnstown, but everywhere were really, really shocked by this. That was a shocking act for a mayor of a city to take. And so he writes in these newspapers, um, people are sort of calling him out for it. And he's saying right here, you can see in this newspaper, he doesn't care what the New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, or any other newspaper thinks of his actions. Um, the people who have not, the black people who have not been in Johnstown for more than seven years need to pack up and get out. And he doubles down on it in all of these different news articles. Um, he says, you know, I'm giving them fair warning. It's for their own good to get out. And he really does just try to kick all of these people out of Johnstown. And um, it attracts a lot of attention. The story attracted a lot of attention at the time in the newspapers. Um, and I thought that this part was really interesting because obviously, you know, in punishing an entire population of people for the actions of one person, that, you know, is something that is just not acceptable. And people in the South actually kind of latched on to this story. And so this article is from the Pittsburgh Courier. And it, the title of the article is Johnstown Offers South Propaganda. And what they're saying in this article um, this is a clip that is a telegram that someone from the American Cotton Association wrote to the governor of Pennsylvania to say this. Um, what he's saying is, this little section here, um, all law-abiding industrious Negroes are welcomed anywhere in the South and will be given immediate employment in cotton fields and on farms where their services are badly needed. So there are people in the South who are seeing this happen in Johnstown and thinking, well, all of these people just left these cotton fields to go work in these Northern industries and now they're being kicked out. Well, let's tell them to come back down here because now we have a labor shortage and we need them to come back to work. And this telegram goes on to act like they don't do that kind of thing in the South and they've never discriminated against a whole group of people because of the actions of one. Um, but it's a really interesting moment that starts this conversation about, you know, what where are people welcome and where are they not welcome? And what can happen in a town when someone does something and all of a sudden no one is welcome? Um, so it's something that I think not a lot of people know about, but there definitely were these very um, clear examples of racism happening in Western Pennsylvania at that time. Um, now I should say there were definitely people living in Johnstown who thought that this was totally unacceptable and shocking. And, and some of those were white people as well. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting Western Pennsylvania example that not many people know about. Um, anything there before we um, move on to this last little section here? Um, yes, I have someone asking, is it known what started the riot in Johnstown that left those three people dead and others wounded? From my reading, I don't know the answer. I don't know if you know the answer. Yeah, so that news article kind of gets into it a little bit. I didn't want to, it's like a nice long thing. I didn't want to clip it all there. Um, it was basically some sort of dispute between two people and this one man kind of took it a little bit too far and the police had to get involved and then it just kind of erupted from there. 
Um, obviously that's taking the newspaper side of the story, who knows what really happened. Uh, but that's sort of what is reported is that it was an interpersonal problem and then it just kind of blew up into this whole situation. Then we also have a question relating to Andrew Carnegie and Bethlehem Steel hmm. and how um, do they have major roles related to poor wages, poor living conditions and poverty in African-American slash minority communities? So from my um, reading, oh, go ahead. Yeah, please go for it. <laughs> um, so when migrants are coming to Pittsburgh, they are often classified on based on their skill. So it got to a point where about 90% to 100% of African-Americans were being labeled as unskilled laborers when they were getting here. And because of that label or classification, they were often given the lowest of low jobs. So yes, it directly did relate to poor living conditions and poor wages. And I'll jump in here and say that we had another question a little earlier on about whether most African-Americans were working in factories during that time. Yeah, I mean, so that is one of the major things that's attracting people to Pittsburgh are these work, these jobs in steel mills. Um, I don't have the numbers on like clear statistics on exactly what industries people were, um, were, were concentrated in. Uh, but for, you know, different people coming to work in the steel mills, the city was growing anyway. So there were all of these other um, jobs people could get in shops. And I know uh, Lillian Allen in her story talks about how when she came to Pittsburgh, a job that she could get as a woman was like cleaning the floors and things like that in a department store. Um, so I guess when you think about the growth of a city like Pittsburgh and people coming in, maybe some people in their family are working in a steel mill, but there's all these other things that people can be doing too. Um, so I know that's not a hard answer to your question, but um, it might give you an idea of sort of people were working in different things, but the steel industry was the real um, attraction. Thanks for that. There have been a couple more questions about the incident in Johnstown um, and both when the time frame of that was relative to the flood that happened in Johnstown. And there's a question about the mafia in Johnstown, but I don't have a lot of context for that. I, I don't either have any context about the mafia in Johnstown. Um, the Johnstown flood was in the 1880s or maybe 18, 1889 or 1890. 89. Um, so, thank you. Um, so um, this incident in Johnstown uh, with the Black people being expelled from Johnstown is, is well after that. So that was in 1923. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna get into this last section here. Um, those are great questions, by the way, thank you for asking those. Um, and so if we're focusing back in on Pittsburgh now and thinking about how um, the community here uh, is, the black community here is continuing to grow, right? So um, I have a chart that I'll show you in a second that shows just how much it grows, but people just keep coming to Pittsburgh. And so there's a moment where people are thinking, okay, I'm noticing that a lot of people are moving around and coming to Pittsburgh. And then all of a sudden, the numbers just keep growing and growing and growing and growing. Um, and so people are still facing, um, as we get into World War II and, and you know, even a little bit beyond that, they're still facing this discrimination in housing, in education, in work, uh, all different kinds of problems people are facing. Groups like the Urban League and all these little neighborhood organizations are still trying to provide relief and support for people. Um, but as I think Jocelyn sort of mentioned in the beginning here, there are also thriving community centers here in Pittsburgh, particularly if we circle back to the Hill District. Um, so when we talk about uh, Black history in America, it's something that always comes up is this idea of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, which references Harlem in New York City and all the different musicians and artists and writers that were part of this growing cultural movement um, in the Black communities around the country. And it wasn't just happening in New York City. There's also evidence of that here in Pittsburgh. And one of the main things that we often talk about when we talk about that is jazz music. Um, we also talk about August Wilson, who is a playwright, who was writing plays here in the city about the Black experience in Pittsburgh. Uh, but something that I think kind of goes back into that that we mentioned a little bit in the beginning is this newspaper called the Pittsburgh Courier. And so um, the Pittsburgh Courier 
is a black owned newspaper, black journalists writing for it. It's founded in Pittsburgh in 1910. And when it was founded, there was only one newspaper here that really shared any news from the black community. And it had its own section in the Pittsburgh press, this sort of Afro-American news section. Um, but this all changes when the Pittsburgh Courier comes out. And so as the Great Migration is increasing and more and more people are coming here, the Courier is uh, growing in its circulation. So it's being sent from Pittsburgh all over the country very, very popular newspaper in World War II, um, made famous by the Double V campaign, which is something we'll talk about in next week's session about the civil rights movement, a very early example of that. Um, and so the Pittsburgh Courier is a really, really key piece of the black story in Pittsburgh um, because it is a way that people are sharing information, sharing news, celebrating when something happens, letting people know what musicians and artists are coming through town so they can make sure to go and catch their shows in the Hill District, all different kinds of really important things that not every city had for the Black community. Um, and so a person who worked for The Courier is a person who maybe you've heard of. His name is Teeny Harris. Teeny Harris was a photographer for The Courier. And he was actually born here in Pittsburgh. So he was born here in 1908. His parents owned a boarding house in the Hill District. And so that is a place where a lot of migrants, uh, Black people moving into the city were staying at least for a little while before they figured out where they were going. And so his family sort of watched the Great Migration happen in a way. They saw all these people coming in and Teeny Harris was here for the ride. He saw the whole thing. He took all of these pictures of life in the Black communities here in Pittsburgh. Um, and this is how we know so much about what was going on in the city. It's people like Teeny Harris documenting it with his camera that give us this information as historians. So his photographs are now in the Carnegie Museum of Art collection. They are doing some really, really wonderful research about his photographs and his work. And they often have really good exhibits about it. So check out the Carnegie for uh, the Teeny Harris collection. Um, but he took lots and lots of pictures of different parts of life in Pittsburgh. Um, and so while he was alive, this is sort of what was happening in the Black community in Pittsburgh in terms of numbers. So before the real like wave of the Great Migration takes off at first, we've got about 37,000 um, Black people living in Pittsburgh in about 1910. And you can see how much that just takes off as the Great Migration is happening. And so um, the city is growing in terms of people coming from Europe, but also a huge growth in the Black population here in the city. Um, and I just like to show this picture here. Uh, this is a Teeny Harris picture. Um, just to give you an idea of um, this, the fact that all of these jazz musicians in particular are not only coming from Pittsburgh, people like Mary Lou Williams, um, uh, lots of different other jazz artists sort of coming from here and playing jazz music in Pittsburgh and around the world. It's also a crossroads where lots of people are coming through Pittsburgh to play in the clubs that are here in the Hill District especially. So this gentleman here is named Duke Ellington. You may have heard of him if you are into jazz music. Um, this is actually at a, a hospital, a veterans hospital where he's signing autographs. And I always just like to see, you know, this audience is, is quite mixed. Uh, a lot of people notice that when they look at this photograph, there are black and white men together, um, enjoying the work and the music of Duke Ellington and also lining up to get his autograph. Um, so there's so, so much that we can talk about when we talk about Pittsburgh and the Great Migration. Um, and these are just a few stories that we've sort of picked out for you. Um, I hope that you can all uh, look up some of the people that we've talked about and learn a little bit more, but I am aware that we are out of time. Uh, so I wonder, are there any last questions that we might want to take before we wrap up? No, I'm not seeing any final questions in the Q&A, Laura, if you see anything that you want to share out. No, it's been pretty quiet today in the Q&A in the chat, but I want to thank everyone for joining us and the questions that you did ask and um, hope you'll go and search some more answers too. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that if you are able to, you can join us for next week's uh, program, which is all about Pittsburgh and the civil rights movement. 
and uh, lots of different people who had a hand in the local civil rights movement that was all going on here in the city. Um, so thank you so much for coming today. We hope you learned something and we hope to see you again. And I did drop that Kahoot in the chat just in case you wanna check that out. Thank you all for joining us today though.